Hi, this is Will Lockwood, Director of Editorial Content for Computer Talk for the Pharmacist Magazine. What follows is a roundtable conversation we hosted for several of our regular authors, in which we talk about what's in store for pharmacy in 2022. We'll cover three topics, uh, building on recent success in providing clinical services, what has to happen to create more time within pharmacy workflows, and how to best communicate the services pharmacy offers and the value those services provide. We hope you will find the conversation thought-provoking. And now, let's get going. We've got three of our, our authors with us today um, to talk about a couple of topics that are um, highlights for them uh, to keep an eye out for the year ahead for 2022. Uh, we've got Ann Johnson with us, who's president of Pharmacy Healthcare Solutions, uh, Ann Johnson PharmD. Uh, Marsha Milanig, RPH, who is president and CEO of Catalyst Enterprises. And Bruce Neeland, who um, is an independent pharmacy veteran. Uh, he's a podcaster. You can listen to him at pharmacycrossroads.com. And you can, of course, uh, read uh, content by all three um, people in uh, the magazine, in the print edition, and online. Um, so we're just going to jump right in. And uh, I'm, I'm Will Lockwood um, from Computer Talk Magazine. And uh, joining us also is my sister, Maggie Lockwood. And Maggie's going to jump right in and um, uh, get us going on the first topic with, with Anne. Maggie? Thanks. Thank you. And we're so glad to have everyone here. This is something new and we're excited to give it a try. So, and one of the topics we wanted to talk about that came up in the cover story were services, uh, independent pharmacy or community pharmacy providing uh, services and, and what kind of, how it's reached a tipping point that um, the, uh, there's going to be quite an opportunity for pharmacists to leverage the success they've already had providing vaccines and point of care testing. And we're kind of interested in getting your take on what the next big services would be, uh, piggybacking on where it's already working. Yeah. Um, thanks, Maggie, and thanks, Will, as well. So, you know, the post-COVID world right now has really lent pharmacies the opportunity to participate in more alternative payment models for providing non-dispensing services. And those non-dispensing retail pharmacy service offerings really have been focused more on preventative care versus treatment. So with COVID, we definitely saw that vaccines, vaccines were a really big part of this care. Um, I read a stat recently that retail pharmacies were responsible for over 160 million of the COVID vaccine doses. And I think other preventable types of services that we've really seen pharmacies take part in you know, we've seen med synchronization, medication adherence, as well as MTM. But historically, these pharmacy services really have not focused as much on testing or diagnosis. But I expect that because pharmacists have now had experience and proven their worth with providing COVID-19 tests, that really it's going to open the door for a lot of other point of care testing for different disease states. So things like diabetes, cholesterol, flu tests, strep tests, HIV testing. Um, we know that some pharmacies are already offering these types of services, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're widespread like we see vaccine administration today. And whenever there's minimally invasive testing that just revolves around you know, a finger stick, saliva testing, I really think that there's a clear role for the pharmacist that's untapped potential there. So we know, you know, payment really continues to be a struggle for these services. Um, pharmacies may need to think about, you know, CLIA waivers and other, um, you know, testing requirements to do this, but it's an area really ripe for pharmacy expansion. And when you think about providing all of these new services, the industry really, I think, is going to need to look for a way to enhance the exchange of the health information and have better, better interoperability. So if we look at the vaccine registries as an example, you know, a lot of those are really done right now at the state level, um, which can create a difficulty for a lot of stakeholders. So, you know, being located in Pittsburgh here in Pennsylvania, I'm near the Ohio and West Virginia border. And you know, during the COVID vaccine um, period, I've actually heard stories of patients going to Ohio for a Moderna 
getting a Pfizer in Pennsylvania and heading south for West Virginia to get their J and J so that they would be totally covered. Um, so, so obviously this is creating some, some interoperability issues. And, you know, I, I think the COVID vaccines, um, you know, really showed us that there's an increased need for that bi-directional flow of pharmacy data into the broader systems. And it would really enable pharmacists to play a bigger role in this testing. Um, to be successful, I really think we're gonna need to be able to see that these diagnosis and screening services can be you know, easily communicated to physicians, integrated into patients' electronic files. But assuming they can do that, um, you know, I think that pharmacies proven success in administering COVID vaccines and testing can expand their role in this area and open up a lot of different alternative payment sources outside of traditional dispensing. And, you know, we know with declining prescription reimbursement rates affecting a lot of pharmacies, providing these types of testing services can really be, you know, a life raft for a lot of these independent pharmacies and give them an alternative avenue of service. I, I, I just uh, want to emphasize, or I, I wish I knew the numbers, but I think the, the big documented but too little talked about foundation that has been built is the number of pharmacies who have applied for and gotten their CLIA waiver certificates because that's the base upon which all of these other things will be built and um, I know I've seen a few reports about uh, you know the, the the large increase in that kind of stuff but that's one of those uh, you know, silver linings in this whole thing is the is the movement towards getting those CLIA waiver certificates, because that's what everything else gets built on. Um, I wish I could speak more to the interoperability piece, um, because that again is another foundational thing. And and Marsha, I know that's kind of your wheelhouse. Do you know how much progress has been made in that? Well, I think it's important. I think Anne raises a really good point. And I made a side note on that because it's something I experience truly every day. I've been called in to be uh, vaccinating because the demand for shots and uh, it has just gone through the roof and, and there's no abatement. I mean, people where I go are fully booked. My colleagues are fully booked. It's very difficult to get a walk-in appointment. But uh, you raise a really good point. I'd love to get some feedback uh, at a forthcoming uh, conference or in a new uh, issue of the magazine from our friend Ben Blummel to see what kind of progress is being made and if they are uh, pursuing any grants to again seek that interoperability with the immunization systems in particular. It has been difficult at times. Uh, Anne raises a great point, you know, Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia. Well, I live in Minnesota. And we have a lot of snowbirds who have been coming back and forth uh, during the holiday season. And I can't access their vaccine records in Arizona or Florida at this point. And unless they have proof of vaccination, I can't, I can't provide them with a booster. I mean, I need to be able to document that they've had their first two doses. Uh, if they've happen to be coming to the same pharmacy, I might be able to find that out through our own computer systems, uh, but that's not always the case. So yeah, I think that's really an area that's been very highlighted. I'll give you another example. Anybody who was immunized at the Veterans Administration System, they did not enter information into the immunization database. Um, hmm. so that's me. Um, yeah, that's me. I, I, I get my shots at the VA. So you don't know that, right? Uh, I can't. Yeah, I can't see that. And I'm not sure uh, if there is, you know, what what this situation is, I had heard that there might be some policy issue related to that. But um, I, I think that's going to be really, really uh, important. One of the, I guess, silver linings in all of this is that people are starting to rely more on mobile technology. And that has been quite interesting to me in terms of people using a new app that connects to the immunization systems and the departments of health so that when they come in, uh, if they've forgotten their vaccine record, the physical card, they say, well, I have it uh, in my docket. You know, and there may be other apps. I don't want to be commercial about that, but 
that's the one I've seen the most. And it's people of all ages. So I think that's really a testament as well to people's ingenuity that uh, they want to know, well, how quickly will what I'm doing with you today get put back in the docket? From a computer uh, consumer's perspective, it is it has mystified me, um, you know, these these little cards that we get and, uh, you know, what are you supposed to do with these and where does this stuff live? And, you know, it's it's considering how important it can be to have that documentation. Um, you know, it's it's it, it it feels like there's a real need here. And obviously a lot of the um, the uh, protocols around this were developed uh, in an emergency context. So we didn't have the time to plan this out perfectly. Uh, but it certainly seems like there's a need to um, now address this vaccine, you know, information availability, uh, much in the way that uh, at one point there was a need to address the um, sharing of uh, uh, prescription uh, monitoring, you know, program information. And NABP came in and built the interconnect and people are able to share uh, for many of the same reasons, essentially, uh, I think it's fair to say. So it feels like there's that need for, for somebody to step in and build this, this interconnecting service that's going to let us um, let us view these immunization records and these reporting systems, um, you know, for, for whoever's actually put them in. I guess if the VA isn't even entering them, then that's another issue that needs to be addressed. So. And that could be a state by state thing. I don't want to make a blank and say right. that all VAs because I don't know that. I just know it in my area okay. more often than not. That concludes part one of our conversation. Be sure to join us for parts two and three.